I was talking with your, uh, your guy, Michael Crotty from Middlesex Magic uh, a couple weeks ago. That's my guy. I talked to him yesterday. Uh, yeah, he said, you know, start with his late, he, he mentioned something kind of offhandedly that, you know, starting with his late father and continuing with him, you know, going way back to your days at St. John's Prep in Notre Dame, that they had a tradition of calling you on game days. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what's the story behind that? And what's your relationship with the, with the Crotties? Uh, family would be the relationship, I'd say. Uh, obviously, different last name, but family. And, um, you know, his dad, so I wasn't a highly touted basketball prospect, shall we say. I was a little more highly touted in baseball, and some would argue even in football and over basketball. But uh, baseball is definitely what people, you know, kind of recruited me for in high school. And so uh, I played baseball all summer. I didn't really play AU basketball that much. I played with a little a local team that, you know, um, they are also like family. But for me, uh, when I decided I wanted to start playing AU basketball and give basketball a shot, um, you know, Mike Crotty Sr., Coach Crotty Jr.'s dad, uh, was the guy who kind of took a chance on me, allowed me to play baseball while I was playing AAU basketball with the Millsex Magic, their program. And he was the one who kind of brought me down to nationals and got me exposure um, in front of college coaches. And he was kind of the one who believed in me. And so my sophomore year was when it started. He'd come, his dad would come to every basketball game. Uh, then I played for him sophomore summer. And then junior year, um, you know, I got a few looks, Division II looks after sophomore summer. Bentley University was the only offer I had. Um, and his dad kind of just stayed the course with me throughout the first half of my junior season. And his dad tragically passed away from a heart attack. Uh, but he would call me before every game, uh, tell me if college coaches were coming, tell me if they weren't, tell me, you know, uh, things that he thought I should work on. Just kind of get me excited for basketball because I had been kind of under-recruited or undermined, if you will. So. Um, when he passed away, obviously, you know, uh, my dad was close with his dad. I was close with his dad, the whole thing. And uh, since, since then, you know, Coach Crotty Jr., he took over the program then. He was, you know, 27, 28 at the time, so not a huge difference in age. And I was his first big recruit. And we kind of went through the whole process together. Like, I had never been through it. He had never coached somebody who had been through it. So we obviously talked on the phone every game day because of the attrition with his dad. But he kind of helped get me. Um, to Notre Dame, get me to have Division One offers. You know, we went through it together, and you know, our relationship became more like brothers than anything else. And so, um, we've just kind of continued tradition all throughout college, all throughout the pros. And you know, every game day, you know, I chat with him on the phone. And it's not even about basketball necessarily; it's just about you know life. He's got two kids now, close with them, his wife, the whole thing. So, uh, it's like a obviously half tragic, half feel good story, if you will. Yeah, the reason I was talking with him, uh, Tyler Collick transferring from George Mason to, to Marquette. Mm -hmm. um, Mike Crotty mentioned that you might have seen him play at a Middlesex practice. Yeah. Um, and you he, and he, he connected you guys on a text message about when he committed to Marquette. Do you just what did you what do you if you remember seeing him play? What do you what, what stood out to you about his game? And what did you tell him about being another New England kid moving to Milwaukee? Yeah, you know, uh, obviously, you know, the Middlesex Magic, I think ironically it's a different scale but they're similar to the bucks and they treat their players like family so like for me I, I feel like i'm a part of that program to this day i always go back i always go to practices i always play with them and i always help kids that are struggling to make college decisions you know just give them my two cents from their opinion because i went through it obviously for the first time and i know they're going through it for the first time so um for tyler he's a tremendous player he's a lefty and he's one of those guys that you know I think he's probably underrated. Uh, he just, you know, something that he has to fight for everything that he gets, and he's a really good basketball player. And, you know, I obviously I, I heard from Crotty immediately when he entered the transfer portal. I started to hear, you know, um, you know, from uh, Bill Scholl, who's a Notre Dame guy at Marquette, and Shaka Smart, and all them when they got the job, and uh, just hearing what they kind of said to Tyler via Tyler. Uh, I thought it would be a great fit for him. And I said to him, at the end of the day, you got to go where you feel best. And, um, you know, if it's out here, hopefully I'll be here for a long time. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll, uh, you know, tear up the, the nets at Pfizer Forum at, at different times of the day, different nights of the week, but all the same. Cool. Thanks, man. Zora.
Hey, Pat. So going back to Sunday and the Nets, um, it was clear in that specific game that the scoring load was with Drew, Giannis, and Chris. Mm -hmm. um, but then you'll have other games where it's like six or seven players are in double figures, including yourself. Um, how much does the flow of the game determine whether those guys are going to get the scoring load? Or is that something that the coaches can predict and say, hey, like with this matchup, it might go this way. Does that make sense? Like, is that something you know going in or is that something you just react to as it's happening? Uh, I'd say that's all flow of the game. Um, you know, I don't think it's something that we game plan for. I think, you know, that's kind of the way the NBA works. Like, you know, Chris Giannis and Drew are probably going to have the majority of the scoring on a nightly basis. And then there are nights where someone's got it going or both two of them got it going or on a, on a great day, all three of them got them going. But like, I think that's where, as a role player and as guys who are, you know, your secondary options, shall you say, to those three, uh, I think that's where growth comes over the course of your career. I think there are times where, you know, guys, especially when you're young, like you can be frustrated with that just because you don't feel like you're having an impact on the game. But as you kind of grow and as you kind of mature throughout this league, you kind of start to realize, or at least I guess I can only speak for myself, you start to realize it's how you have an impact on the game and it doesn't just have to be scoring. And I think that's where obviously, you know, things don't show up on the stat sheet, things do, but winning the game is the most important thing. And when you got three guys like that, that are going, it shouldn't be a, a, a negative for a role player. It should be a positive as far as, you know, we're going to win this game and I can find other ways to uh, contribute and, and have an impact on it. And like you said, some nights you have to stay aggressive. That's the one thing you have to make sure that, you know, for me last game, uh, I didn't. I took two shots. One of them I should have made, but it was the fourth quarter. I hadn't touched the ball yet, and I probably should have put a better shot on it. But the second one, you got to be ready to shoot, and you don't know when they're going to come. And if it comes with two minutes left in the fourth, when we're up three, you got to be ready to shoot it just as you would be if it was your tenth shot of the game. And I think that's something that our team does a really good job of because there are so many guys that are talented on the offensive end, so many guys that can put the ball in the basket. Uh, but when you got the three big dogs, you got to make sure that you're playing off them and you're you're getting your looks and you're getting your stuff in the flow of the game. And that one shot you did hit was at a crucial point in the game. Um, and I think this probably comes with growing and maturity as well. What do you do? Or is there a coach that's telling like, how do you know, like, I'm still supposed to take this shot when these three guys are the guys that have been, you know, scoring all game, pivotal moment, you've got an open look. How, how do you know that's still supposed to be your role in that moment? Uh, I think it's, you know, growth from a m mental uh, standpoint. You know, physically, everyone that's here talent-wise, like everyone has the talent to make shots or drive or do whatever your strengths are. But mentally, you got to be able to stay locked in. And for me, I just kind of think, like, my number one goal is to win the game. So when I have a checklist before the game, I talk with one of the assistant coaches uh, who I've gotten close with, and, you know, the goal is to win the game. The second goal is to play well. And playing well doesn't mean scoring. Playing well means having an impact on the game in a positive way. It might be def it's got to be defensively rebounding things that have to be there every night in and night out in order for me to do my job. Um, and then it's shoot good shots. And when you're open, you got to shoot it. <laughs> and there's going to be nights where you're going to find yourself open more often than not. And there's going to be nights where, you know, you've got to go back on the film and learn from it because you've passed up a few open shots. And I think the those are kind of the three checkpoints that I really try to look at is, you know, win the game, play well, and then make sure I'm at least sh I'm shooting good shots and I'm shooting them with confidence. Who's that coach for you? Uh, ben Sullivan. And does Ben then kind of go with you after the game to see if you checked all the boxes? Yeah, so we talk about it, not necessarily right after the game, but, you know, the next game when we're watching film. And there are nights where we, we try to, you know, find ways where I can – play better that has nothing to do with scoring the basketball. You know what I mean? On defense, there are nights where, you know, I might go for a block, I should have tried to take a charge. Or I could be a little more physical before a guy catches it in the post. Or, you know, I could be a little more uh, a step quicker on help defense or rotating or whatever that might be. Um, but for the most part, uh, I would say it's learned afterwards uh, and it's learned probably the next day uh, unless it's a back-to-back. -back. Eric? Uh, were you match yourself for passing up the three in transition on that play? Because Chris found you in transition. It was pretty quick, and you made the extra pass to Dante. Like, did that feel like the the right play, or was like after you let it go, you're like, man, I should have my feet set, and like if I get another one, it's going down. Yeah. Uh, see, that's a 
I, I would say that depends on who you talk to. Uh, for me personally, I think I made the right play. Like, it's just like there was a play earlier in transition where I kicked it to Drew, he kicked it back to me. I could have tried to finish a tough layup over somebody and maybe got an and one. But if I see PJ open in the corner, I'm hitting him. If I see Dante open in the corner, I'm hitting him. I think, you know, it's, it depends. If I had made five threes in a row, yeah, maybe I, maybe I would have yeah. taken that shot. But uh, I think one of the things as a team that when we're at our best, we're doing well, the ball's popping. We're moving, the ball's moving. It's quick. It's not necessarily a thought. And so when he hit me in transition on that, I had Dante in the corner of my eye. I had Jeff Green trying to play both. And I knew if there was a hesitation on that, he might have been able to kind of steal that pass. So it was just going to be a quick rip. And I told Dante when we went back to the timeout, like, you better shoot the next one. Uh, but you're 100% right. Like, I was ready to shoot the next one regardless of, you know, what the situation ended up being. So you make that shot, and then on the way back, I saw you talking to Chris, and the next play, it's a, it's an immediate switch. And uh, I'm curious for you, with Durant, do you guys think about, like, how easy you give up a switch where it's like, okay, I know if it's Drew or it's PJ, like, maybe I should give them, like, a second more to get back. Or if it's Chris, I can give him a chance to get over the top. Like, how do you guys kind of process that? Because, I mean, you threw a bunch of different looks at, at Durant when you like when I just rewatched the tape it was like okay there's there's a bunch of different stuff going on here and different things for different guys so like how do you guys kind of talk through that yeah I mean we're talking through it constantly the one uh, uh good catch by you the one we were talking about with Chris on that one uh it wasn't about the switch but it was just about his comfort zone and the play before when we had switched I kind of played him in what I thought was a little bit more towards the help but it was towards his left and when he has that left hezy pull like not a whole lot you can do about it. That's his comfort zone. And that's what me and Chris were talking about. So on that next switch, it was about being in him and forcing him right a little bit more, making it, putting him in a, I mean, look, is one of the best players in the world, if not one of the best players of our generation. And I think it's just about putting him in a position that isn't his comfort zone. There's a lot of comfort zone he has, but when you're trying to pick <laughs> your poison, you want to make sure you're putting him in a position that's just a little bit harder. Um, and he's going to make some, and he's going to miss some. And for a guy like me, Look, I'm going to do my best to, to make sure it's tough on him, be physical with him, do the little things that I've learned how to do over the course of my career. But, you know, I'm 6'5", he's 7 feet tall. So I got to try to put him in a position where he's a little less comfortable. And um, I think you're right. You know, we try to throw different looks at him. We just try to make sure we keep him guessing. So he's just a little bit more out of rhythm. Thanks. Uh, Steve McGargy. I'm wondering, these two games you had with Brooklyn, you had the two games with the Sixers earlier, even though they weren't full strength. How much do y'all can use these as like a gauge for how ready you are for potential playoff matchups down the road if those happen? Or is it a totally different thing when you're late in the regular season versus a potential postseason there? I mean, anytime you get to play teams that, uh, you know, have the talent that they have and, you know, there's talented guys across the NBA in general, but anytime you get to play the favorites, uh, it's something that, you know, you want to make sure you're putting your best foot forth. I think for us, the – thing that I took from the game, the best part about it was just how hot of a start Brooklyn got off to, scoring 37, 39 points in the first quarter, and us being able to kind of stay the course. I think uh, as a group, we felt we've, we've dropped a few games that we obviously shouldn't have, and sometimes that's predicated off, you know, playing to the level of your competition. And I think for us, we want to hold ourselves accountable for how we play the game of basketball. And um, there are teams that are going to get hot, and we got to figure out ways to stop that. And to be able to do that against a team like Brooklyn, I thought was really important because I think we've put together flashes over the last few weeks, month, or whatever, showing how we can play. But I don't think we've really put it together for a full four quarters. And you know, that first quarter, I think we could have played better. I think they were hot, but we put it together for three quarters after that to close out a game. And I think that was you know the most important part that I took from it. Lori Nickel. Hey, Pat, I think you told us once this year that you didn't even have to ice after a game. So I don't know if you relate to this at all, but can you tell that Giannis is hurting? I mean, he'll drop 40 or 50 points and look fine on the court. And then afterwards, to me, you know, he's sighing heavily. He sounds like a 70 year old man. Can you tell that he's playing through pain? Uh, you know, Giannis is one of those guys where he's about as strong as they come. So I think I would say it's more about the season in general is one of those seasons where it's kind of unnatural. You know, you're playing so many games in such a short span. And for a guy that goes 110 percent 
on the court on a nightly basis. Uh, I think recovery is just that much more important. Uh, and I think, you know, obviously he twisted his ankle the other day. That's going to be sore at times. There's just no way about it. But I know he's putting in the work, you know, with the physical therapist. He's putting in the extra work as far as icing and recovering and Norma Tech and all that sort of stuff. And I think um, for him it's just a matter of making sure he's putting himself in the best position to be able to go 110% like he always does. And uh, I'm sure he's taking care of it better than any of us can kind of guess. Thank you. Uh, back to Zora. Just a quick one for you, Pat, going back to KD and you talked about getting him out of his comfort zone because he's so good though. And he'll probably just get his, no matter what you throw at him, how much of an emphasis does coach or you all put on like containing everybody else? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you're absolutely right. I think we put it in a little bit of a different facet. Like we, we kind of tailor it towards our own defensive principles where, uh, you know, for us, we want to try to guard the three point line and we want to protect the paint. Uh, I think the, the vivid memory that I have was last year in the bubble against Miami, uh, not even in the playoffs during the regular season. Uh, we were trying to protect the three th so much that we were giving up the paint and they were making threes. And that's one of the things that I would say irks coach the most. Uh, so in a similar facet, you know, we want to stop Kevin Durant. We want to do everything to make it tough for him, but we can't have him going and other guys going. And so I think it's that much more important for us as a team to guard uh, team wide, like a team defensive strategy, like we have to be scrambling. We have to try to make it tough on Kevin, but we have to make sure that on the backside, we're matching up with guys. We know where Joe Harris is. We know where their shooters are. We know where there are guys that are shooting a little bit less of a percentage than, you know, their, you know, knockdown guys, if you will. And so it's about that kind of basketball IQ knowledge and then being able to communicate. And that's where I think, you know, talking to Chris going to a timeout, talking to PJ Tucker, even during the course of a game, that level of communication that we've tried to amp up a little bit um, over the you know last week or so is something that uh, I think will be even more important and magnified in the playoffs. All right, two more. Uh, let's go to Jim Ozarski. Hey, Pat. Um, curious if you uh, noticed this in practice. I obviously have not been able to get in there to see how you guys do your vitamins and if you can kind of see what other guys are doing. But Brooke, Brooke has talked about uh, not just in games, but in the big man stuff where it's trying to work in a Euro step um, above the, above the three point line. Um, obviously the things he's been asked to do differently defensively with switching and being comfortable getting out on a guard. Um, I'm just curious your perspective on that. I, I mean, he's what 12 years in the league. He's being asked to maybe do things either he's never done or it's been a long time. Um, just, yeah, your, your perspective on him just, a, being willing to do it, to try it, to be willing to fail maybe at times in order to get better later. Um, how, how you've seen him accept it and, and maybe implement some of these things. Uh, I'd say Brooks probably one of those in that category, one of the most underrated guys we have on our team, just with all the versatility that he has both offensively and defensively. And I think, you know, the things that he works on are to make the things he does even a little bit better. Like the Euro steps, sometimes the – dribble series he does before he takes a shot with a step back, this, that, the other thing. It works on balance so that when he's in a catch and shoot situation, it's that much easier for him. He's done it off balance. There are times where you saw last game where he's had to pick on Drew, he's going to roll and then he has to backpedal to the three and he has to take a three. Well, if he's not working on some of the things that are quote unquote out of his comfort zone in practice, that shot's going to be a lot harder for him in a game. Um, but I think you know, he's the best, like, as far as what he does for us on the defensive end, I think, you know, goes unnoticed from the public's point of, spec point of perspective. Um, you know, we obviously appreciate it and we uh, try to tell him, as much as, tell him that as much as we can. But uh, I think he's having fun with it, to be honest. I think for Brooke Lopez, you know, he wants to play. He just wants to be out there competing. He wants to win. Um, and to be able to put himself in positions 12, 13 years in the league that he hasn't had to do in the past. I think he's taking it as a, you know, one of those exciting challenges. All right, last one to Marcus Johnson. Hey, Pat, um, you and PJ, I guess they had you guys conversing on the sidelines when he was wired up during the game. Specifically with PJ, has he, or how much has he impacted toughness? When I say toughness, I mean, you know, tenacity and focus and intensity and approach. 
you tell me, has he? And if so, how and how much? Uh, he definitely has. Yeah, I'd say, you know, he's amplified it, magnified it, whatever adjective you want to use, uh, you know, ex exceptionally, ex extremely. Um, he's one of those guys that obviously he plays bigger than he is. We all know that. We all see the positions that he's guarded, he can guard. But uh, for me, I always come back to the communication and the little things, the things that, you know, quite frankly, I've always tried to do. I'm not quite as big as him. I, uh, I'm strong, but I don't know. he's a little bit built a little bit differently than myself. And uh, I think for to add a guy like that who his communication level is that high, but his toughness is equally, if not uh, higher, uh, is something that's going to pay big dividends moving forward because when winning in the playoffs and winning these games against the Brooklyn's and even the games that, you know, we put ourselves in a position where they're close down the stretch, it comes down to one, two, three plays. It doesn't come down to a lot. And I think when you can add guys like that who understand it but are going to over-communicate, are going to over-exemplify their effort, are going to put themselves in positions where, you know, to do the dirty work, those come back and those really make an impact on the difference between winning a game and losing a game. And uh, I, it's, it's great to have them. It's been a pleasure to play with them. And it's exciting knowing, you know, we still got eight-ish games left uh, to get ourselves to a position to be comfortable playing with him in any position with him at any position during any point of the game before we head to the playoffs. And Pat, quickly, I mean, there was a play when you defended, I think it was Jeff Green down in the post late. Yep. But I mean, you got, you got down, forearm in his back, pushed him off it. I mean, is that, does PJ have anything to do with that? Was that, is that just, just kind of how you found yourself in that position uh, during that possession? But it just, you just, I mean, you dug in like, like I've, I've never seen you dig in. I mean, I've seen you dig in like that. But that time on that possession, I mean, you were just really, you know, dedicated to not giving in to, to him. Is that part of that toughness aspect that, that, that a PJ can bring to this team? Uh, definitely. Uh, you know, I think the first year that I really started playing in Portland, I remember Marcus Smart tried to take me to the post right away. And it's kind of that thing that I feel like players do when they think they have an advantage, when they think you're a weak defender or something like that. So for me, since that day, I've told myself I'm not going to get posted up again. Or if I do, I'm not going to move. Like, you can, you can post me up, but you're going to stay in the same spot that you are in when you start trying to back me down. But I think the things that I've seen Tuck do have really helped. Like, on that possession particularly, you know, just the body position I had, where I kind of put my leg so that I didn't move as much are things that I've learned from Tuck and things that – you know, it's infectious. Like when you see Tuck doing a Tuck guarding Joel Embiid and Joel Embiid's not moving, well, if I'm guarding Jeff Green and he's not Joel Embiid, I better make sure I don't move or else I'm going to be seen as not as tough as Tuck. And so it's one of those things where I think that competitive nature, but, um, you know, goodwill, competitive nature amongst each other, that really helps us uh, add that level of toughness and, you know, puts me in a position where I guess. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to impress somebody who's as touted and as good of a basketball player as Marquise Johnson is. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Good stuff. I appreciate it, Pat. Thank no you. problem. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Pat.